Welcome to the lecture over angiosperm reproduction. So we're going to look a little bit closer at the reproduction in angiosperms and other plants today. So first we're going to label a flower and its reproductive parts. So I'm going to go through these one by one. You should see a diagram in your notes packet similar to this. And next to each of them you're going to write their function so you can have that for those functions later. So first we're going to talk about the sepal which is down here at the bottom of that flower. This is a leaf-like green uh, portion that's arranged in a circle beneath the petals, and this is what protects the ovary of the flower. Next are the petals. These are leaf-like and colorful, and their main function is to attract insects. The stamen is the male reproductive portion of the uh, flower and it is contained of two parts the anther which is this tip here which produces the pollen containing the sperm for the plant and then there's the filament which is the stalk that supports the anther so the pollen will be in the anther the stalk is just going to support that the whole structure there is called the stamen And then the pistil and the carpal are the female reproductive parts. The female part is made of a sticky stigma here, which is where the pollen grains land. It's very sticky to catch the pollen. And then there is a style that transports the sperm to the egg, which goes down here. And then the ovary is down here at the bottom, which contains the ovules, which it has the eggs inside. So in order for a flower to be considered a complete flower, it has to have all four or organs, the sepal, the petals, the stamen, and the pistil. So this is an example of a complete flower. You have your sepal at the bottom, your petals, your stamen, which is right here and your pistol, which is right here, just stigma and style. But then an incomplete flower lacks one of those organs. So this one has the sepal, it has the petals, it has the stigma style, that pistil, but it does not have the stamen in this flower. So since there's no stamen found, this is going to be an incomplete flower. Now knowing this, which one can self-pollinate? The answer would be the complete flower because it has the male reproductive parts, which has the stamen and the pistil of the female part. So they can self uh, reproduce because the pollen can go straight to that stigma to pollinate the flower. This one is not able to reproduce on its own because it's missing those male reproductive gametes. Here's just another picture of the structure of the flower with it labeled for you. Now looking at this flower, is this a complete flower or an incomplete flower? This would be considered a complete flower because you have your sepal, your petals, your pistil, which has the stigma and style, and then the stamens. So it has all four parts. Now pollination is just the term that is talking about the transfer of pollen from the stamen to the pistil. So pollination can happen in a variety of ways in one plant from complete flowers or it can go from one plant to another. And there's a lot of different organisms that help pollination occur like bees and other organisms that can help transfer pollen from the stamen to the pistil. There's different types of pollination. First there's self-pollination and this is where the stigma receives pollen from the same plant. So we have our stigma here, that sticky part. If it ends up receiving pollen from the anther on this plant then it's going to self-pollinate because it's reproducing by itself. And then cross-pollination is when pollen from one plant is going to be carried to the stigma of another plant, but the plant is the same type of plant. And so if a bee comes and carries pollen from one plant to another that's the same type, that's going to be cross-pollination. And this allows for the exchange of genetic material, so the offspring are going to be more genetically different 
than that of an organism that's self-pollinating. Now there are different adaptations for pollination that can attract different animals so that those animals can help um, fertilization and pollination in those plants. First there's nectar that they can produce to help attract bugs or birds in order to get the nectar. The petal color also can attract the different organisms to help pollinate. And then the scent is also something that will help attract pollinators. Now, how are seeds formed? After fertilization occurs, the flower will then die and then the seed will start to develop. The ovule will become the seed coat, which is going to protect the embryo. And the zygote then divides, becoming the embryo inside the seed. And then there's this co cotyledon, which is inside the seed, which serves as food storage to help give that embryo nutrients until it can go through photosynthesis. Now seeds remain dormant until the conditions are right for development and growth. And so that's why you can have seeds in a package and they're not considered dead, they're considered dormant because they're not actively growing and they're going to wait until the conditions are right to develop. Now germination is the development of the seed. And so once the seed starts to develop, that is germination. And typically for it to start germination, it needs water, oxygen, and good temperatures. Now the ovary can also develop into a fruit. fruit can, fruits can be dry like nuts and grains, but then they can also be fleshy like oranges, peaches, tomatoes, and squash. And these fruits, the purpose of them is to protect the seeds, but also help in dispersal of those seeds. So whenever organisms will eat the fruit, they can also release the seeds to um, other parts. Let's say you have a bird coming in and eating this watermelon, and it physically eats the watermelon seeds. It can then poop out the watermelon seeds somewhere else in another area, and you can have those seeds still reproduce in that area. So from here you guys are going to watch the plant reproduction amoeba sisters video.